Welcome to everyone who is joining us today. My name is Rob Strayer, and I am the Executive Vice President for Policy at ITI, the Information Technology Industry Council. At ITI, we represent the global technology industry from hardware to software, cybersecurity, platforms, digital services, data centers, and tech-enabled companies, all of whom are driving innovation around the world. Our 80 member companies are headquartered in the US and around the world. We're excited to partner today with Ally, the Latin American Internet Association for a dynamic series of conversations about shaping a new age of innovation in the Americas. Digital transformation has been underway for years, but the past two years of the COVID pandemic accelerated the rate of digital transformation and made digital connectivity even more essential. The pandemic also changed how we interact with each other how companies do business, and how governments reach and respond to their constituencies. The differences in achievement for communities that are connected compared to those that are not connected also grew. These challenges are particularly pronounced in the Americas. This year's Summit of the Americas will bring together leaders from the public and private sectors to discuss solutions to design and launch major regional policy commitments and initiatives that seek to increase cross-border collaboration on a broad range of issues impacting the region. Thanks to efforts by governments and industry, digital transformation is helping to address problems like financial system exclusion and unemployment. And digital tools are supporting better access to services such as education and healthcare. The key to maximizing economic opportunity in Western hemisphere economies is to leverage digital transformation and to advance the policies that support it. Digitalization stimulates business innovation, creates opportunity across economic sectors, increases efficiency in production systems, and improves governance by increasing transparency. That is why, in, a, in addition to organizing today's event, ITI and Ally jointly developed a set of policy commitments to foster a more resilient, dynamic, and inclusive digital ecosystem across the region. We are releasing this set of digital policy recommendations to encourage ambition at next month's Summit of the Americas. The recommendations range from facilitating affordable internet access for all people to cooperating on cybersecurity, implementing good regulatory practices, strengthening cross-border data flows, making supply chains more secure and resilient, and promoting international trade. These are all policy issues that will demand sustained long-term commitments and engagement among all stakeholders. These commitments will demand close collaboration between governments and the private sector, but also regional coordination. We hope the conversation today is a positive step in that direction. We have a diverse group of speakers from tech companies and governments throughout the region. They will discuss their work and what the future of cross-border collaboration on digital policy issues should look like. In our first panel, which is moderated by Maria Madrona from HPE, Bill Davenport from Cisco, Carlos Rebellon from Intel, and Cindy Rayo from Mexico's Ministry of Economy will discuss their visions for a digital trade agenda for the Americas. They will highlight successful initiatives and propose action items to address challenges such as the digital divide. On the second panel, moderated by ally Sisi de la Pena, we will discuss the digital transformation of SMEs and the importance of sound e-commerce facilitation and digital financial inclusion policies. The speakers on that panel are Bernadita Piedrabuena from the commission, uh, a commissioner at the Chilean Financial Market Commission, Francois Martins, Martins from Mercado Libre, Rafael Moreira from the Brazilian Micro and Small Business Support Service, and Anna Vasconcelos from Visa. As you can tell by the geographic distribution of our government speakers alone, the internet's essential to our discussion today. So now let's turn to the policy of how we can help millions more in the Western hemisphere take full advantage of the digital economy. Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rob, and good morning, everyone. Thank, and thank you to ITI and Alive for the opportunity to discuss how the Americas can best leverage technology, digital transformation, and digital trade to emerge from the pandemic stronger and more resilient. 
As Rob mentioned, joining me for today's discussion are Cindy Rayo, General Director for International Trade and Services and Investment at Mexico's Ministry of Economy, Bill Davenport, Senior Director for Government Affairs at Cisco, and I think Carlos Revellon is also joining us, Government Affairs Director for the Americas at Intel. The Summit of the Americas theme is building a sustainable, resilient, and equitable future. And this morning, we'll discuss how the summit, regional leaders, and policymakers can enable a policy and regulatory environment that promotes digitalization to help the region emerge from the pandemic stronger by stimulating innovation, transforming value chains, and supporting better access to, better access to services. We all know that the COVID-19 pandemic was a catalyst for accelerated digital adoption in Latin America. In mid-March 2020, internet traffic surged by more than 40% overnight. And according to Statista, 13 million people across Latin America made an online transaction for the first time in 2020. But digital adoption across the region remains uneven. According to GSMA, 45% of Latin Americas do not have access to the internet. That's more than 285 million people and around 45 million live in areas without any coverage, networks, or telecom services. So the baseline question for our panel today is, how can the Americas bridge the digital divide and ensure that digital transformation enables, long, enables long-term value creation for the region? How can regional leaders ensure that advances in technology and increased adoption do not exacerbate inequality? So to start, let's drill down on the digital divide. Closing the digital divide in the region is key to reaping the full benefits of the overall digital transformation agenda. What are some of the technologies and policies that the region can implement to accelerate the digital divide? Let's start with a technology and industry perspective on this one. Uh, Bill, do you wanna take this one? Sure, thanks Maria. Uh, I should start by saying uh, thank you to, to you and to ITI for inviting me to participate in this panel. Uh, I actually just started at Cisco from the FCC less than a month ago, and uh, so this is my first uh, appearance on behalf of the company, and I'm really uh, looking forward to learning uh, from my fellow panelists. Um, so the digital divide is something that um, governments around the world are very focused on right now. As others have said, the major focus has been uh, in response to the pandemic, that all these um, services that before people were accessing possibly in person now really are available online. Uh, and I think the importance of being able to access its resources like education, uh, working from home, telemedicine, uh, and many other things really just was um, brought home uh, during the pandemic as many people struggled to be able to access those things otherwise. Um, and governments are responding. Uh, the United States, for example, uh, has uh, passed almost $100 billion in funding uh, to build out broadband infrastructure and provide support for people to receive affordable broadband. And uh, Latin America is also responding. There are governments uh, throughout Latin America that are passing laws that require the continuation of internet access during COVID-19 lockdowns. There are programs, I know uh, my fellow panelists are probably going to talk about what Mexico is doing. Uh, so people are responding. But what's happening, I think, is that um, the importance of different types of technology is coming to the fore. And one of the things at Cisco that we're very focused on is Wi-Fi and how Wi-Fi is a very, really valuable resource for the unconnected and for the people who, have, um, who are underserved. Uh, Wi-Fi is something that um, many people rely on as a, um, in terms of public Wi-Fi, in terms of shared Wi-Fi. Uh, in the United States, for example, there are uh, low-income communities, public housing communities that share uh, a Wi-Fi connection among multiple uh, building units. Uh, and uh, it's, I think, in the, you know, libraries, uh, restaurants, uh, there are cities that have public Wi-Fi resources available. And millions of people in the United States, and I think in, in other parts of the world, rely on these resources to, to stay online, particularly those who can't afford a broadband connection of their own. Um, and so one of the things that we are really trying to do at Cisco is just to make sure that uh, Wi-Fi is up to date and modern and that everyone who relies on Wi-Fi can actually make the most of their broadband connection. And so we have really focused, and I know we've worked with a number of regulators throughout Latin America to ensure that um, new spectrum resources are brought to the fore to make the most of Wi-Fi. And that's specifically, I'm talking about the six gigahertz band and how um, 
you know, many countries are adopting an approach of opening up the entire 1200 megahertz of the 600, 6 gigahertz band to Wi-Fi. Uh, we think that's really important because that will allow new technologies to be able to use Wi-Fi. As I said before, many low-income people rely on it, many small businesses rely on it, and having the full capability of being able to use Wi-Fi for these new technologies like ultra high definition video or virtual reality or augmented reality is absolutely critical uh, for Latin America to remain competitive and also for everyone to be able to enjoy the same services and opportunities as the rest of the world. Thanks, Bill. Thanks for that. I mean, at a Hewlett Packard Enterprise, we've been working very closely with Cisco on this effort across the region and across the world um, on opening up the six gigahertz band for these unlicensed uses, including Wi-Fi. Uh, you know, we totally agree and think of digital connectivity and internet access as an essential service, as essential as water and electricity. So, um, Cindy, let's turn to you and, and see how Mexico has been dealing with closing the digital divide. And I know you're engaged in many initiatives across the with governments across the region. So we'd love to hear your perspective. Yes, thank you, Maria. And thank you to the ITE and Ally for the kind invitation. Um, well, let me give you some kind of context. Uh, um, um, actually, we are facing uh, fragmentation and digital trade barriers. Uh, and, and all of these are increasing. Um, these, these create counterproductive effects and digital gaps. And I recently read a report from the OCD and the OCD found that the main barriers to digital trade were, for example, data localization requirements, which has doubled to 62 countries. And this requirement is often justified on, their, on cyber, cyber security or data privacy concerns. There's also restrictions on the ability to use cloud services due to certification requirements, among others. So all, all of these kind of barriers it inhibits the development of electronic commerce and increases the costs, the costs and inhibits the, participa the participation of SMEs in the digital trade. And from the from from my perspective and, and what we, we have been uh, taking too much account uh, in Mexico is that uh, there are many ways to overcome this digital divide or to, to limit these kind of barriers. Um, and I will focus on three main ways. Um, the first one is to ensure cross-border data flows. Mexico has included provisions in, in its recent free trade agreements in the digital um, uh, uh, chapters uh, where include a, an obligation to ensure cross-border data flows. Cross-border data flows are crucial for the growth of the digital economy, underpinning the internet and the global economy. And also global data governance becomes more important in light of the implementation of new technologies such, such as 5G and the internet of things, as well as the acceleration of digitization triggered by the COVID-19 pandemic. So these trends broaden the scope for vast data collection and monetization globally. So far, global governance on of data and digital technologies has taken place on different tracks. And we can see different approaches taken by China, the European Union, USA, which may lead to a fragmentation on data governance and without a coherent underlying global framework to create trust. And this could lead to a blockage in, in terms of data sharing. So, uh, we think that to address these concerns, govern, governments must allow free flow of data and collaborate on strategies to govern data and cross-border data flows. So, and it's also necessary to identify ways in which trust can be built through responsible data governance standards and certifications. And, and, and how enterprises can build trust, letting individuals and organizations see what is happening with their data. Another important way to, to, to address the digital divide is 
through the harmonization and convergence of rules at the international and regional le level. In the case of Mexico, several efforts have been taken during the last years to foster and to enhance regulatory coherence at both stages. At the multilateral level, under the Joint Statement Initiative for e-commerce at the WTO, Mexico is participating in the discussions to draft uh, a modern framework on e-commerce. This initiative includes uh, uh, many uh, disciplines for electronic commerce, uh, just to mention uh, a few, consumer protection, data protection, um, cybersecurity, um, logistics operations, uh, promote paperless trading, among others. So the WTO members under this initiative seeks to achieve, uh, to achieve a high standard outcome that builds on the existing WTO agreements and frameworks, and, and to modernize rules, harmonize regulations, which allow to the creation of open, transparent, non-discriminatory and predictable regulatory frameworks. In addition to this, at the regional level, Mexico has been implemented several uh, efforts to close the digital gap. And, and I, let me give you an example, the Pacific Alliance uh, uh, Agreement, um, uh, where Colombia, Chile, Peru, and Mexico are part of this agreement. We have been working together with the Economic Commission for Latin America, with the Inter-American Development Bank, to develop actions for the creation of a regional digital market. This market is conformed by three pillars. The first one is uh, to improve access to connectivity. The second is for creating an enabling environment to promote the exchange of digital goods and services. And the third pillar, pillar is developing a digital economy that promotes growth, productivity, and employment. And under each pillar, there are several, several objectives and actions, which seeks to reduce the digital gap and these actions has to do, for example, um, by analyzing the current legal frameworks, sharing best practices and experience and promoting projects in technical areas, such as the telecommunication sector, new technologies as 5G, FinTech, artificial intelligence, and others. So, um, uh, these, these are uh, the main actions that we have been doing in order to address uh, um, uh, the, the regulatory coherence. And lastly, but not less important, and a third way is the development or deployment of infrastructure and use of emerging technologies. The digital infrastructure, such as the ICT networks, physical infrastructure, digital platforms coupled with new technologies, such as 5G, are enablers for promoting the use and development of digital economies. And also a faster internet connections and access to the internet can enable SMEs to overcome information related trade barriers to entry and to foster the development of SMEs. So this can be achieved through the adoption of the ICT networks to uh, with the adoption of five generation mobile networks, which are superior to the telecommunication the standards of the, of the past. So this, uh, this can allow uh, a, a much higher uh, data download speed, and, and this will help to uh, transit to a next generation of um, telecommunications and to reduce the digital gap. So, in some, I, I, I think that I take a lot of minutes, but I, I just want to wrap up. Governments should work towards providing affordable, uh, high quality access to the internet and should develop policies for the mobilization of investment in the ICT infrastructure, both public and private, as well as in the creation of a regulatory environment to close the digital gap. 
Thank you, Cindy. It, it's great to have Mexico as a leader on these issues, not only at the multilateral level, but also, you know, at the regional level in the Pacific Alliance. Um, talking a little bit, moving and. Uh, it's, uh, it seems like our third panelist, uh, Carlos Rebellion from Intel, is having some trouble logging on. So we'll hope he'll join us a little bit later to add to some of these points because Intel certainly has a great perspective on these issues as well. Um, let's, um, Cindy, you mentioned a little bit uh, about you know the the digital economy pillar of the of the Pacific Alliance. And I know that that pillar also includes the digital transformation of government services, or at least it did several years ago at the last meeting of the Pacific Alliance I've participated in pre-pandemic. And um, you know, we know that the digital transformation of government service that services can help accelerate this adoption of connectivity. You know, if citizens have a reason to connect, um, to, to pay their taxes, to access their health records, to to go to school, um, it, it accelerates that adoption and as well as build trust in the ability of technology to improve transparency, fight corruption and make government spending more efficient. Um, this was all accelerated out of necessity during the pandemic. What should governments be, be taking into account uh, going forward as they continue to the digitalization of government services? Um, Bill or Cindy, I have some thoughts myself. So um, from, from the Hewlett Packard Enterprise perspective, um, do you, either of you wanna take this one first? Um, I'm, I'm happy to go first. Um, right. You know, a, a, as you said, um, the pandemic really accelerated a trend of moving government services online uh, that was already underway. Um, and what we saw uh, is that, you know, people, uh, those services really did struggle. Uh, in many respects. I think that the number of people that were trying to access a lot of these services online uh, just exploded. Uh, and then many services that were traditional sort of go to your local government office and you know process paperwork or interact with a, uh, with a, with a government official, that wasn't available anymore because those offices were closed. Um, I remember at the FCC, we received a lot of complaints about of um, permitting offices in the, uh, government agencies not being open. So telecommunications companies couldn't deploy new equipment because they couldn't get the permits because the offices were effectively closed. Um, there are stories about, um, I know that the state of Florida, for example, um, had a, a fairly basic website for its unemployment compensation system that it wasn't great to begin with. And then when the pandemic hit and a lot of people were seeking benefits, the system crashed over and over and over again. And people who desperately needed those funds to support their families were cut off and had no opportunity to get that money. Um, so governments have been investing a lot of money and time into moving services online uh, to accommodate those needs. And also really to, uh, I think also accommodate their employees who are looking for more flexibility in terms of working from home. Um, so one of the things that Cisco I know has been very interested in in, in helping uh, government agencies is moving services to the cloud so that um, information can be accessed more easily remotely. Uh, the information is also so more secure and um, things are just able to move more rapidly and more efficiently. And so um, speaking about unemployment compensation, uh, the state of Rhode Island actually moved its unemployment compensation uh, portal to the cloud, its entire system. And so that is operating at a much more efficient uh, pace. Uh, I think I recall something like prior to the modernization, the state could hold handle 75 uh, concurrent calls into the system seeking unemployment compensation. And now it can handle 2000 concurrent calls at the same time. So major, major improvements. I know we're gonna talk about security later on, um, but also added security. So this is, this is a trend that's really positive and I think it's only accelerating. Thanks, Bill. I um, totally agree that um, it's really enabled a lot and facilitated a lot for, for people throughout the pandemic. But also, you know, from the Hewlett Packard Enterprise perspective, we think that governments can also generate really powerful outcomes when they properly properly connect and leverage data that's in the cloud. You know, it, extracting value from, from data from government services is essential to enabling governments to advance their policy goals, everything from improving healthcare and strengthening defense to advancing education and safeguarding the environment. Um, 
but I don't want to, I, I see Carlos Rebellon has joined us. Thanks, Carlos. Glad to have you here with us. You know, we've, we've talked a little bit about the perspectives on bridging the digital divide and now digital transformation. Wonder if you want to jump in. And um, I know you, hopefully you were able to listen while you were having trouble logging on. But if you wanted to add anything from your perspective in terms of what policymakers in the region can do on, um, bridging the digital divide and also in this acceleration of digital transformation of government services. Thank you, Maria, and thank you to all the audience and IPI and Ally for this effort on, on having us with this discussion. Uh, indeed, I have some log on efforts. Cybersecurity is, is always <laughs> a, an issue because you always need, to, at certain point in life, you are going to be asked by passwords and logins that you never use, but it's okay. So digital gap and digital divide definitely is, is an unsolved matter in the Americas. Um, and, and mostly because, because we are a region with a lot, of, a lot of inequalities that most come from the combination of an affordability issues, geographical issues, and, and especially skills gap. Right, so, so we are not now facing not the typical um, digital uh, communications network access problem, but also with the, with the skills gap, we are going to experience more and more uh, uh, divide in terms of access to newest technologies like AI and so on. So the first realization that most governments and as an industry, we may have is that no, the same formula that has bring us here is not the same formula that will help us to solve to solve all, all this problem. Uh, and affordability gap, especially, has been has been very pervasive, and and it can be solved if you keep taxing, if governments keep keep taxing and rising spectrum fees. So probably, if we take a look of, to the countries that has solved this, this better, or at least that enjoy of a lower gap uh, adjusted by income, like Canada and US in the region, we see that this can be solved with a, with a mixture of policies that combines um, license spectrum and license spectrum, different ways to, of sharing spectrum, and, and also reducing regulatory burdens and um, putting the prices on, on license spectrum in the in a reasonable amount. So many positive things have come from Brazil uh, this year. Uh, all governments recognize that Brazil is leading, allocating the enough spectrum required for 5G and Wi-Fi. And also, uh, the, at least the, there is a generalized perception that the prices were not fixed, uh, thinking just in fiscal in increasing increasing fiscal income. So I see in the in the in the current work that Ally and ITI promoting opportunities in the harmonization of the six gigahertz band that will enable us to access a lot of spectrum needed for for Wi-Fi, but also many statements related with international standards, and that includes spectrum price, and that includes regulatory burden. Only if we, we can start thinking the addressing of the digital gap differently, using all the different technologies, what license and license share spectrum. And at the same time, if we reduce the regulatory burden and spectrum cost, we can expand the market frontier. And by expanding the market frontier, you will need less funds to cope with the, with the population that cannot recover by the market. So if we just continue trying to fight the current gap without trying to expand the market frontier, it's, it's going to be impossible to cope with the digital gap. Thank you. Thanks so much, Carlos. I think it's great that you brought up that afford affordability piece of it. Um, it. It's really critical to ensuring that this digital transformation across the region is, is equitable. So thanks for raising that. Um, building a little bit on, on your cybersecurity challenge just this morning and you know the cybersecurity risks that may be coming uh, with kind of this kind of ex 
accelerated, we've said accelerated a lot today, but this accelerated digital transformation um, across the region, you know, the transformation of digital government services and just, you know, online schooling. What are, what are, um, what should governments be, and, and the private sector, it's the digital transformation across the whole economy, what should governments and private sectors be doing to manage these risks effectively um, in, in terms of security and, and perhaps also the privacy of their citizens? Bill and Cindy, do you, do you want to kick, kick us off on this one? Yes, sure, Maria. Well, I think that there are a lot of challenges in relation to cybersecurity from the public and from the private uh, perspective. And, uh, and the main challenge is to find an adequate mechanism for prevention and response. Uh, for instance, and, and given the nature of the fast evolving types of attacks in the cyberspace, it becomes difficult to adopt a prescriptive compliance approach to face cybersecurity threats. So far, an um, international regulation is, is in some ways not foreseen in the, in the short term. On the contrary, uh, there is a tendency that, uh, that, contra that countries around the world um, have already considered different kind of approaches. But in the case of Mexico, we have already included uh, some provisions on cooperation on, on cybersecurity, for example, under the USMCA and under the uh, agreement uh, under the CPTPP, where there are are some compromises on cooperation uh, between uh, um, countries um, it, with, a, with a risk approach um, uh, and in order to prevent the cyber security attacks. And let me just uh, give a specific example on what we have been doing uh, uh, with, the US and with, the, with the US under the high level economic dialogue. Here we, we have been working uh, with, with the US under this economic dialogue um, to, to, to find a collaborative, collaborative way um, uh, or uh, 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 through cooperation to mitigate or to exchange views in order to uh, share best practices, uh, standards, uh, to mitigate threats, uh, strength, uh, strength cybersecurity protections in the global value change, and uh, to facilitate cooperation in tackling cybersecurity challenges through international industry practices and its and standards. And just to give you a, 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 an example, in uh, we have recently created a site, a website dedicated to this high level economic dialogue and in, in the Ministry of Economy page. In this site, um, users, for example, can consult uh, the pillars of these projects, as well as some materials on cybersecurity best practices developed uh, and translated into Spanish uh, by the National Institute of Standards and Technology, the NIST. Thank you, Cindy. Bill, can you give us a little bit from the industry perspective? Sure. Well, I just want to uh, foot stomp uh, Cindy's comments. Uh, you know, it's I think that, uh, you know, security, uh, cyber criminals don't stop at the border and cybersecurity shouldn't either. We really need an international approach to cybersecurity. Uh, that adopts a global approach. Uh, so, you know, as Cindy mentioned earlier, you know, we, we want to have um, a uh, international perspective in terms of the, um, the standards that we apply for cybersecurity. Rather than having country specific requirements, we should be looking at what can we do from an international perspective so that um, different entities or entities are subject to the same sort of requirements uh, across borders. Uh, the NIST framework Cindy mentioned uh, earlier is exactly the kind of framework that we would encourage uh, governments and companies to adopt. Uh, you know, having these principles set out and really trying to follow them uh, is critical. Uh, we should also prioritize standardized our testing and certification requirements um, over country specific mechanisms. Uh, you know, cybersecurity is something that has just exploded in the last few years, and it really is um, driven home just by recent events. I know that uh, the, the issue in Costa Rica, for example, um, from the last couple of weeks, 
I think the last report that I saw was that 27 agencies in Costa Rica now are basically shut off from their data. Um, they can't, uh, you know, it's affecting foreign trade, it's affecting people getting their paychecks. Um, local governments in the United States are under constant attack for, by ransomware gangs. So this is a, a critical issue for governments and obviously companies as well. And so I, I think that the, all the trends that we're seeing are very positive. Thanks, Bill and Cindy. Um, let's pivot a little bit to supply chains. Uh, one of the priorities for the summit is strengthening regional trade and supply chains. Um, how can governments in the Americas best take advantage of interest in, in this interest in uh, nearshoring or friendshoring um, in the, the ICT supply chain and attract investment? Um, I'd love to hear from Carlos, um, you know, semiconductors have been front and center in this supply chain resiliency issue lately. So I would love to hear from Carlos about how you see the, the Americas leveraging this moment, uh, not just for your industry, but also broader ICT. And then from Cindy, if Cindy could maybe talk a little bit about how Mexico, uh, Mexico already has a well, well established manufacturing industry for ICT, but what what else is Mexico doing in this in this moment to, to become an even more attractive destination for French? So, um, Carlos, let's start with you. Thank you, Maria. As, as you mentioned, semiconductor is only an example. We, we need a full comprehensive ICT goods and services value chain working in the Americas because there is no doubt that we can work better as an integrated market. If we just become an isolated market that is completely dependent in, in, far, in regions where where transport, health, or any other kind of problems can, can affect, uh, we, we can lose many opportunities. So semiconductor is definitely one of the areas where US government has been highly active in, in, in promoting capabilities in the US, but that will benefit the full region because we must start from the point that there is no single country in the world in ICT that can be autarkic, right? That can be self-reliant on his own value chain. So that presents a lot of opportunity for those countries that can uh, realize that the best way to create a resilient value chain in this continent is to reducing the most, any kind of barriers for digital trade of trade of goods and services, digital goods and services. And, and that starts uh, by reviewing, for instance, devices. In many countries, devices are very hard to be entered. Homologations procedures has been growing everywhere and they are not standardized. So there are many opportunities there. In, in our industries, in many cases, in countries where uh, R&D is performed, like Canada, Brazil, Mexico, even Costa Rica, uh, you need to allow fast track mechanisms to, to import and export uh, test uh, equipment, for instance. So all these things uh, makes, uh, I believe that uh, may require a review where, where we, must, we must check where are the countries in terms of a, a World Trade Organization agreement on IT goods. We must review on fast track. We must we must review on, on standardizing and making more flexible homologation rules and so on. And, and with the easiness of, of of goods moving in and out, we can we can be a more resilient uh, value chain, reducing the regulatory burden for IT goods and exports and imports. And in that sense, free trade agreements has played a very, a very important role. I, I just want to close saying that thanks to free trade agreements and this approach to, to commerce in a country like Mexico, for instance, we were able to, da, to have a very positive dialogue with, with the legislative there. And we prevent that uh, a, a rule uh, called sovereignty, technological sovereignty passed that was intended to prevent the imports of ICT goods. So Mexico is a good example where sovereignty is under discussion, but they realize that they can't progress in, so in technological sovereignty without having proper 
movement on goods and service, services between the countries. Thanks, Carlos. Totally agree from my prerogative as moderator and HP perspective. Cindy, can you just give, give us um, a couple of minutes? I'd like to turn, um, you know, to 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 the uh, the idea of a regional digital trade agreement before we close. But just a couple of minutes on the perspective from Mexico in terms of of, of this, how to leverage this moment in time and, and in the interest in your French touring. Yes, I will. I will be very, very brief. Um, uh, data shows, for example, that the global value chains accounts for some eighty percent of international trade, uh, and 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 most developing countries are increasingly participating in these global value chains. So that's why it is really important to uh, develop or deploy some kind of initiatives to have uh, to facilitate secure and resilient supply chains. Um, and, and, to, and to cooperate uh, and help each other to take advantage of the ICT supply chain. Uh, and in line with this, Mexico and the US under the high level economic dialogue, um, they have in, uh, held some, some meetings, some bilateral meetings with relevant actors mm -hmm. to better understand the opportunities and challenges that both countries have. For example, uh, Carlos mentioned the, semi the semiconductor supply chain. And in addition to these efforts, uh, uh, and with the aim to promote compatibility and regulatory matters on telecommunications and ICT, uh, we have been working to promote policies for open and competitive markets for a secure and interoperable international communications networks um, through the creation of a formal cooperation forum between both countries uh, that includes the participation of stakeholders. And, and, and the main topics of the agenda are commercial investment opportunities on ICT, on 5G, the development of next generation ICT networks and expanding broadband connectivity. And also investment and business environment for the digital ecosystem. Thank you, Cindy. Um, we've, we're wrapping up soon. So three minutes left on our discussion and I, I left a big question for the end. Um, but you know, on our on ITI and Eli's wish list for the Summit of the Americas for outcomes outcomes of the Summit of the Americas is uh, the initiation of discussions on a re regional digital trade agreement. Um, Cindy and Bill, you've both been in government and parts of these kind of not only high level meetings, but trade negotiation discussions. How do you see this progressing or moving forward at the regional level? Is USMCA, the USMCA digital trade chapter, the model, the starting point? Um, what issues should we prioritize? Um, welcome your thoughts on this. Um, well, I'll start, but I, I'm really interested in hearing what Cindy has to say on this one. Uh, you know, I think from, from my perspective, I would say that there are two major priorities. I'm sure there are many other things that should be factored in, but uh, really it comes down to uh, the digital divide in cybersecurity. You know, I think actually having concrete uh, deliverables, uh, commitments from the, the member countries, the participating countries um, on, as we discussed earlier, a global approach to cybersecurity, international approach to cybersecurity, as well as, um, you know, commitments to building out uh, broadband infrastructure and, and addressing what, as Carlos mentioned earlier, uh, the, the affordability issue, that there are so many people that actually are in areas, particularly cities, that have access to broadband services but simply can't afford it. So, um, you know, a commitment from countries to actually to, to invest more resources and to work towards addressing that issue would be key from our perspective. Thank you, Bill. Cindy. Absolutely. I think that the digital uh, uh, chapter um, commerce digital e-commerce chapter under the USMCA is a, is a, a great reference. It, it includes modern provisions uh, and provides an international framework of rules and principles to generate certainty to the electronic transactions and operations, and also to uh, eliminate uh, obstacles to the development of digital trade. And the, 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 this digital chapter lays the foundations to, to, to increase competitiveness of companies with the 
objective to facilitate the participation or promote the participation of SMEs in the North American market. So the, the USMCA aims to create opportunities for companies for the region and, and, and with the idea that companies could get access to a great number of consumers beyond their, their communities and, and markets uh, because the North America uh, market represents 5 million potential consumers. So it is highly important to, uh, to, to take into account or to have this kind of provisions. And absolutely, it is a, a, a reference. And I just want to, to, to add that there are challenges. The one is that uh, uh, one of the, the, the bill that, that, that Bill mentioned related to cybersecurity. Uh, I think that this is the most challenging issue, issues, um, and and because the, the, the cybersecurity has a broad impact on areas such as national security, that's, that the security protection of assets, uh, and, and and all of that. And another challenge under the USMCA um, is that we have an obligation under the chap under the digital e-commerce chapter for not imposing custom duties, duties to digital products. Uh, and the great challenge is the expansion of the moratorium on tax uh, to enable small enterprises and consumers to get access to digital products at lower prices and in an effective way. Thanks so much, Cynthia. Carlos, we're a minute over time, but I wanna give you the final word on this. I think that uh, the exercise that all governments and authorities may do when they uh, produce or they are designing regulations is always to take a look to the, to the in the case of Mexico, USMCA has a lot of provisions that, that are, are positive and, and, and the, it's a very positive exercise also when regulators are designing their technical rules and so on that may have an, a relation with import exports to take a look and, and review if they are compliant with treaties like USNCA or any other FTA with, in the case of the other countries in the region. Well, thank you all. Thank you, Cindy, Bill, and Carlos for the discussion today. I mean, I think we're in agreement that, you know, increasing connectivity is, and, and bridging that digital divide is key to enabling or to unlocking the benefits of the digital economy for the region. And, you know, and plus the added need for, for digital skills and training. Um, thanks all. And now let me hand it over to Raul Echeverria, Ex Executive Director of Ally. And apologies for running a minute or two over time. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much, Maria. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Raul Echeverria, and uh, I am the executive director of ALAI, the Latin American Internet Association, um, a regional association of internet companies. <clears throat> we are very glad uh, to partner today with ITI for this uh, event that facilitate a very necessary dialogue in order to inform the discussions at the coming the America Summit this is a, a very good opportunity, this summit, to advance the discussions on digital development and digital economy. Uh, first of all, I would like to, to thank the excellent uh, panelists uh, that participated in our first panel today. And thank you uh, also to you, Maria Medrano, for the very good moderation. Um, it's crucial that uh, we exchange ideas and experiences about uh, good regulation practices. Um, it's imperative that we develop a new internet regulation approach for all the Americas region, but uh, also mainly for Latin America. We need our own uh, regulation model and approach, and an approach that provides, uh, of course, the best framework to protect uh, people's rights online, and at the same time provides the, the best avenues to accelerate the human, social, and economic develop development. It's uh, for all the Latin America. Lat Latin America needs uh, at this moment uh, good uh, economic uh, recovery strategies and a more inclusive development model. And digital development is central to achieve those objectives that, for the benefit of all the people in the region. We at Alai, of course, expect that these issues uh, is, uh, to be central in the discussions at, at the summit, and we can see some uh, agreements uh, and 
and advancing the dialogue among all our countries as a toward making progresses on digital development in the, in the sense that I mentioned before. Uh, so I, I will pass now the talking to my colleague, uh, Cici de la Peña, who will moderate our second panel today, a panel that uh, will go around a very fundamental issues to advance the objectives uh, that I mentioned before. How to financial digital inclusion can increase the opportunity for of SMEs to successfully participate in digital economy. The uh, SMEs are responsible of 50% of the GDP in Latin America, and there is no um, opportunity of a, a successful digital transformation for the region without the full participation of uh, SMEs. And financial inclusion, um, its digital payment methods are something that is uh, fundamental for SMEs to participate successfully in digital economy. So uh, I expect you have a, a very good discussion and CC, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Raul. And thank you everyone for uh, being here. Thank you for uh, to ITI and um, to have this collaboration, this uh, to promote this dialogue across uh, with, with Alive for to identify what are the needs for um, the Latin American digital transformation in order to promote digital economy. Um, in this panel, um, in this panel, we are going to discuss the relevance of the digital transformation process of SMEs uh, to foster inclusive economy recovery in the Americas, as well as how the implementation of financial inclusion and e-commerce facilitation policies are crucial to these policies. Um, in these panels, we have the pleasure to have uh, on board um, Rafael, Rafael de Farias Moreira, um, Rafael, I, I, I can see, I, I think he is, he is there. Yep. I, I can see the, the, I can see the, the yeah. Hi, Rafael. Good morning. Uh, Hi. Morella Sebrae from uh, Sebrae. Uh, we also have um, Bernardita uh, Piedra Buena from the government of Chile. Uh, I'm just trying to, um, I have the list here. Um, we have also Francos Javier de Resende from Mercado Libre in the private sector and Ana Vasconcelos from Visa, also from the private sector. Um, so having said that, the economic and social crisis resulting from COVID-19 and physical distances, distancing measures accelerated changes in production, demand, and businesses management models. An example of this is the increase of the use of e-commerce, which in a few months reached a development that was expected to take a few years. The need for a response, the need, um, the need, uh, the need for a response to the crisis was we no doubt throughout promoting innovation and the use of advanced digital technology, technologies. The development and adoption of digital technologies in all areas of the productive system will be essential for economy reactivation, opening opportunities for entrepreneurship and productive development. Having said that, despite the fact that micro, small and medium sized companies account for 99% of the industrial fabric and create the majority of jobs, their productivity is extremely low compared with that large of companies. So the digital transformation of SMEs is something that is definitely needed um, uh, and identify how this uh, process of digitalization could be incorporated um, and many small and medium and many small uh, and medium enterprises are still facing big challenge, challenges in order to include this into their daily daily activities. The e-commerce may be the clearest example of how this transformation um, posted and was a, and showed the need for this digital transformation across all the SMEs uh, in order to, for, to foster digital economy. Um, one element in particular within this framework is the digital payments which is just one part of the new generation of financial services and have a huge impact on the development of the economy and the development of a highly inclusive uh, from various points of view. 
um, we recognize that digital payments tools are fundamental for the insertion, insertion of SMEs and even micro SMEs in the economy due to their easy flexibility, low cost and adaptive adaptability to low value transactions. So in this sense, um, I, I would like to ask, uh, I would like to, uh, to have a general question. Uh, probably uh, I would like to see who is the first one who would like to respond. Um, so given your current role, what have been the key priorities for your organizations when it comes to fostering digital transformation and financial inclusion? Um, probably we will, I don't know, uh, will we start? Anna, that, that's great. Hi, hi, Cici. Um, I work at Visa, and Visa has Visa's purpose is to uplift everyone everywhere uh, by being the best way to pay and be paid. Uh, so our efforts are focused on the design and deploy of, innate, uh, of innovative digital payment solutions that would help uh, individuals, business, and other stakeholders, governments, and etc., to participate in the digital economy. Uh, we believe that digital payments, which is our focus in, in my specific role, uh, would help to benefit the consumers, merchants, and also governments to the, reduce the size of the informal economy. And also, it's a critical source of empowerment to different stakeholders like the micro and the small enterprises that you mentioned, and also women or any other undeserved populations. And it, it would also help to reduce business costs, offer security and convenience to consumers. Uh, in June 2020, uh, Visa made a commitment to digital enable 50 million SMEs worldwide. And in my role, uh, I have to help to, com to, to be committed to this, to, this, um, to this commitment of Visa. So uh, in my role, I support the SMEs in the region to be digitally enabled, to execute this commitment, and also to help them to find a new and creative solutions to offer their products and services that could only exist in the digital environment. Um, usually we focus on easy to use solutions that will help those users, those merchants and small um, and micro businesses to do secure transactions and accessible transactions um, in, the, in their ecosystem and also help them to uh, be included in the uh, digital uh, sector, digital economy. Great, thank you, Anna. That's, that's, that's a great initiative that you have had. Uh, it seems like you have been implementing quite a lot of initiatives in order to include this. Uh, as we were saying before, the digital payment uh, component is being, has been essential. And looking at the digital transformation of MSPs from a financial uh, inclusion standpoint, what challenges and opportunities does the pandemic present for the economy and inclusion of MSCs in the digital economy? I would like to hear from Bernardita, who is the commissioner uh, uh, for the Central Bank of Chile. Uh, I would like to hear this perspective from the government point of view. Thanks, Cici. Many thanks for the invitation. I want to to precise that I don't work at the Central Bank of Chile, I work at the CMF, that is the uh, regulatory authority in Chile as independent from the government. So as I said, the CMF is in charge of the supervision and fiscalization of the all financial market in Chile, except the uh, pension funds. Uh, our mandate is to <clears throat> ensure the financial stability, appropriate market conduct, and promote market development. In this sense, uh, we saw during the pandemic a lot of opportunities and, and challenges for the, the financial inclusion, not, not only for SME, but also for the more vulnerable people. Uh, we saw that the opportunity to, to offer better and customized financial services uh, was there and was uh, and the financial the fintech sector take advantage in order to offer this product using technology. I mean by technology lending by platform, crowd lending, crowdfunding, credit credit scoring using algorithms. 
uh, identity verification, in insurance tax, uh, access to payment system, because the, the uh, uh, ecosystem for payment system was prepared before the pandemic because of there are some law and norm in, in uh, um, approving the Congress that allow the, the different customers, SMEs, and more vulnerable vulnerable people to to open checking account in order to make those payment by by internet using technology but also we saw uh, there were challenges that uh, be, become more critical or critical critical that was the cyber security and personal data protections uh, and in this sense, uh, in the government, uh, there, they are um, making progress in some laws that are necessary in order to regulate those aspects in the market. Uh, one of them has approved, the only one is still discussing in the Congress, the Personal Data Protection Bill. And, and that is a challenge for the SME, for the technology, the, for in particular for fintechs, uh, the financial uh, firm that use technology in order to 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 offer their products. Um, I I finished there in order to give time to the other panelists. Yeah. Thank you very much, and thank you for highlighting the regulatory and the norm, and the, the, particularly the regulatory framework that uh, faces some, well, that the fintech sector are facing in terms of challenges. And in that sense, I uh, I will let Francois to, to give us an overview on how, from the financial point of view um, and policy coverage, um, merging for digitalizations, what is the degree of integration with other promotion policies and coherent design for the development of the productive sector for the SMEs? I mean, what are those uh, challenges from, from your point of view? Um, what could you tell us about how the development of the fintech sector across the region in an environment or in a company like um, uh, Mercado Libre, where basically it's just uh, giving a space for SMEs to bust and to and to come back to the economy for those who probably lose their jobs? I mean, it's a tool for the SMEs to reincorporate or to incorporate to the um, digital economy. Meanwhile, the fintech component of this uh, e-commerce has been a key element in developing this, uh, this activity. What could you tell us? Thank you, Sissi. Uh, first of all, thank you to Alai and um, ITI for the invitation. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, yeah, so let me uh, focus on, on three key priorities that maybe can help us uh, uh, pose the discussion here. So, Lately, uh, I think three key priorities have been uh, business resilience, uh, access to services, and uh, moving the regulatory and business environments forward and see if we can address the challenges of tomorrow. And uh, what we've been doing for the, late, um, uh, for the latest 20 years or so is exactly that, trying to move the needle towards the challenges of tomorrow. And, Really what happened with the construction of the Mercado Libre ecosystem was that we started from an e-commerce uh, idea to give access to, to democratize commerce, which is exactly our mission at Mercado Libre, uh, our initial mission. And we found out that for that, we needed to give some confidence in that ecosystem that people just didn't really perceive as being uh, safe and sound for their businesses to thrive and for um, their needs to be fulfilled. So what we tried to do is uh, was to um, lay those confidence. We, we had to build Mercado Pago in order to give confidence in the financial transaction that needs to occur in one sense. And then you have the logistics uh, uh, side of it that occurs on the other on the other end of the transaction and with that we found out that 
one of the great gaps of the digital economy is really to move money around and to help people, uh, as Anna was saying, um, pay and be paid. That's one very hard thing to do, especially in our region where people are not really connected to the grid. I mean, the electrical grid as a very basic need, not really connected to the internet. And we need to help them get connected there. And once they are there, we need to give them the tools in order for them to be able to develop their economic activities, personal activities, if they're buying something. And we need to do that with some sort of some level of resilience and confidence. So this is what we've been trying to do to offer. And uh, I think we've been, uh, uh, we've been able to see during the pandemic that it was absolutely key for companies like ours to be able to uh, accelerate what they had uh, forecast for the next five or so years, accelerate that and ex execute in one or two years in order to offer those services to the people who were needing them. As you mentioned, some people uh, lost their jobs, people lost their revenues, and they had to find ways to be able to uh, overcome those difficulties and certainly the digital economy helped that. Um, and if we want to actually have a positive impact here, we need to do this in a comprehensive, uh, coordinated way. So this, as, as I mentioned, uh, our financial arm came from the e-commerce need, right? So it's not out of the blue, it's absolutely from a need that comes from elsewhere that probably wasn't seen at the beginning. We need to do that. And uh, I think one thing that I wanted to point out here as absolutely necessary is, and I'm, I'm kind of throwing a ball uh, to, to Rafael here from Sebrae, and maybe he can expand here, um, um, is the fact that we need to help companies actually be born and thrive and exist. And with that, we need to kind of digitize government services in order to make that uh, a more seamless experience and fluid thing so companies can be born and thrive uh, in, the, in the general economy. And uh, I think that's one of the, the latest missions we have given ourselves at Mercado Libre. Great. Well, great, great. When, then I think uh, we have this conversation pretty going very fluently. And obviously, Rafael, advisor from the technical board at Sebrae, um, we would like to hear what, where, how the government will probably face uh, these uh, challenges as were mentioned by, by Francos. Uh, what, what, what could you tell us about this? Um, what could we do in order to help um, not only the, the, the big companies who are trying to put forward these mechanisms for the SMEs, but also what could we do for the SMEs to, to have this incorporation in the whole system of the e-commerce and the digital economy, particularly with a point of view at the financial system. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Cici. Thank you, Raul. Uh, thank you, ITI and Alive for, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here uh, to discuss such an important uh, issue. Uh, first of all, uh, we we work mainly. Uh, I work for Sebrae. Sebrae uh, is the Brazilian small micro and small business uh, support service. We uh, work mainly on three main fronts when we talk about uh, the digital challenges uh, for the, the SMEs: uh, digital inclusion, digitization, and digital transformation. Currently, uh, we work to include more SMEs in the digital world. So uh, to, foster, to foster the better use of these tools to increase competitiveness of those that are already connected and to help those small business that are already digitized to also transform the business model to be better prepared to compete in the digital world. So uh, those are three very different challenges. Uh, but in all three fronts, especially in the first two, uh, the digital inclusion and digitization, uh, financial inclusion is definitely an essential com component. Uh, just to give an example of, of uh, good practices that we have seen in Brazil in the last two years since the pandemic has begun, uh, I can talk about uh, uh, the, the emergency relief program launched in April 2020 uh, by the federal government 
They have directly transferred cash to informal workers and micro entrepreneurs exclu ex exclusively through a digital bank account uh, freely provided by Caixa, a federal public bank. Uh, that was one uh, successful story that I'll talk about uh, really fast about it. And also PIX, which is an instant electronic payment system uh, launched by the Brazilian Central Bank in November 2020. Uh, that enables the quick and mostly free execution of payments and transfer through cell phones. So just, just to cite those two policies, uh, more than 105 million people, which is about half of Brazil, uh, Brazil's population, open digital accounts to receive the emergency relief. Uh, 35 million of them uh, had never had a bank account before. So that's about 16% 16 of our population. In less than two years of its existence, more than 125 million Brazilians already use PIX, which is already the main way of transferring money in Brazil. So now the, nowadays in the retail and service sectors, Virtually, virtually every small business, formal and informal in Brazil, accept PIX as a mean of payment. So just to give these two examples of how we can use uh, 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 the financial inclusion, inclusion uh, policies as, as, as a way of also helping with the digital inclusion. But Francois Chavet uh, brought a really important uh, uh, issue, which is, how we can work with uh, SMEs to make them uh, be competitive in, in this world uh, dominated by, by huge platforms that obviously help them to sell more, but also uh, pose challenges because they have less, uh, uh, I would say, sometimes they have, to, they have a smaller margins because of that. So it's a very competitive world and, and Sabrai uh, has to help uh, not only those that already sell in those huge marketplaces, so how can they they uh, can get better margins, how they can sell more, but also how can we help new businesses or uh, established business uh, to enter those platforms in a, in, a, in a more competitive way. So those are huge challenges. Sure, definitely. And you mentioned something very important um, here. You said uh, it is a very competitive world. And um, given the fact that uh, in this global uh, economy at the moment and how, uh, and how Mercado Libre previously said, um, this, the, with this democratization of the trading industry in a, in a very competitive world, we need to help SMEs in order to be able for them to incorporate this. Uh, it, and, and this is a responsibility from various sectors. So I wonder, Anna, and, and I also would like to hear the, the same point of view from, uh, from Bernardita. What do you think uh, private and public sector, how do you think private and public sector could work together to address some of these challenges in terms of this competitive business, in, in terms of this um, digital trans, uh, transformation, in terms, particularly in the sector, in, in the frame of the digital payments, financial uh, fintech sector. Uh, how can we make those uh, synergies to work together in order to, to help these SMEs? Because basically at the, at the end of the day, um, the SMEs in Latin America provide approximately for 90% of jobs uh, across the region. Um, so, so it's something that we definitely need to foster. So I would like to hear from you, Anna, how can we make these partnerships, happen? but to make them, um, I mean, to make them real. Mm -hmm. make this Good, thank you, Cici. Um, I think the public-private collaboration is, is key and it have, have have brought digital maturity in the past to the ecosystem. And I think it's essential that they work together, the government bringing the, or the public sector, bringing their expertise and enable, enabling uh, like policies to enable those SMEs to grow. And let me talk about that first and then the private sector, how they can work together. But in the, in the public space and the, and the policies needed for those SMEs to be included and to be able to, to compete to the point that we've discussed before. I think uh, those policies obviously vary a lot from country to country and place to place, 
but I think they, they their goal is very similar and they, they move around three topics. The trust and security for the SMEs to do their business, the opportunity for them. I think a, a very important thing is the, um, is the frictions that they have today in trade in the exchange of their goods and services. So I think the, um, the policies around trade are very important to open the opportunity for them to, to be able to sell their products and services to uh, anywhere. But we also need to help them to have the, the skills, and we've talked before, to use the tools, to use the digital tools that we will enable for them, the private with, uh, with the public uh, sector. And those skills uh, we help, it would be to help them to be empowered uh, to adopt those tools, those digital tools that we've talked. And to give an example of a public and private um, uh, collaboration that went very well, I'll give an example with Visa. Uh, we worked with the Dominican uh, government. We piloted um, an educational platform uh, with a non-profit organization in the country. And this partnership had the goal to allow women that are entrepreneurs in the market to increase their knowledge in budgeting, market, and business knowledge to help them to grow that, their, that business. So Visa worked with the Dominican uh, government and this nonprofit organization to, to do this pilot with the women's entrepreneurs. And the pilot proved to us that the digital tools that can help to educate them and to empower them in their business uh, would help uh, small migrants, small businesses like the women's uh, and to entrepreneurs to grow their businesses and to be able to be educated to use those digital tools. So I think this is the kind of example of um, partnership between public and private that can work and that we can help to uh, develop the ecosystem of uh, micro and small businesses. Great, thank you. I probably would like to hear now the point of view from uh, the government side. So. Bernadita, would you, would you be able to say something about it? Yes, thank you, Cici. Uh, related to our uh, mandate, I mean the financial system, um, we, we, we see some huge gaps in terms of financial assets. There are uh, people that is lagging behind the financial access. So we are trying to focus our work, how to improve the, the access of people and SMEs to financial services. In this, in this sense, we, we have a lot of instance of cooperation with, with the private sector. Uh, for example, every time that we publish a norm, uh, we counsel to the private sector their views and how to improve this norm in order to, to, to improve the access of the people of the services. We also uh, participate and send information to the Ministry of Finance uh, in order to send uh, bills to the Congress to change the law, to um, increase competitions, uh, in terms of the financial services. Uh, for instance, today she's in the Congress a law, the FinTech law a bill, in this case, that is trying to regulate the FinTech system uh, in order to give more uh, judicial certainty to those sector, in order to put a regulation according to their risk, I mean proportionality in this regulation, uh, and all of this, the objective is to increase competition and with competition, those sectors that, that are underserved by the incumbent will be able to access to better financial uh, services and, and products. But also there is something very important in terms of the private sector, that is the auto-regulation. Sometimes the, the, the people that is underserved by the financial system is people that uh, don't, uh, don't have enough edu financial education. So uh, not only the, the, the law, the norm and the government regulation has to deal with this uh, matter and try to, to make a, a system that is friendly and protect those people, but also the private sector has to be uh, aware of the, of to, 
um, not to uh, or aware to be very transparent with the sector, aware about the there is some abuses in the in some part of the industry to to deal with that to to try to correct that, and also the private and public sector has to work together. Uh, trying to improve the financial education of those uh, people and SMEs, because here in Chile, for example, the, the, the gap is, is huge. Thank you. Yeah, I think um, I really like, um, I get two points from either, uh, from Anna and from Bernardita, and both of them mentioned something very important, financial education of SMEs and digital skills. I, I take these two points from these two points of views from the government, from the private sector, something as, as it is very, very relevant, it's something that we need, uh, probably something we need to put forward in order to help uh, increase the digital transformation of the SMEs uh, within the digital economy of the region. And uh, in that sense, probably we are just um, about the closing, uh, near to the near to the end of the time uh, in that sense i will leave this uh, open question to any of you how can we um this with these big challenges in terms of digital skills and um, financial education um, uh, but also with this digital integration uh, given the fact that the digital economy doesn't just it doesn't have geographical boundaries basically and um, with trust and and, and cyber security problems uh, are coming basically from across the region and, and also globally and um, with this um digital skills financial education across the region which are the mechanisms or the the forums the what are the activities what are the the, the tools that we that we could do as a way of integration in this financial, from this financial point of view across the region. I mean, how the, what are the governments in terms of uh, Brazil, Chile, uh, in this case, uh, what are those uh, international forums, uh, commitments, how can we make this integration uh, to work in order for us to help the SMEs with a particular point of view on these uh, dig uh, digital skills and financial education. Um, does, does anyone has anything to, to say about it? I can go if you want. Please. Yeah. Okay. So um, as uh, Anna and Bernadita were speaking, I was thinking of uh, one very good example of uh, public-private uh, cooperation. And this one is a uh, Brazilian one. It's the open finance uh, infrastructure and governance. Uh, it's, um, it's a big, big effort from both sides of the, the table, the public and the private sector. It was a very big push from the Brazilian Central Bank that was really uh, adopted by the private sector. And today, I think we have a very strong governance structure. It's still evolving, but it's very strong, very multilateral. And it really, uh, in, in my opinion, as a policy professional, really showcases how uh, how good we can work together and how how big things can be achieved if uh, we give it the energy and the effort uh, necessary. Um, it really transformed the Brazilian landscape, services and access. It really increased competition. Uh, it really gave access to new service providers and with that it gave access to people to new services in general. Right, so it really comes down to financial inclusion in the, in the end. It, it is what it does. And uh, I think it's a very good example of, of uh, interoperability. As you were speaking of convergence and uh, inclusion and how we can do the things together, I was thinking uh, maybe in a larger uh, landscape internationally, uh, one very, recurrent word is interoperability. So you need to make what's happening in Chile, for instance, work with what's happening in Colombia, in Brazil, in Argentina, in Mexico, if you want, 
this region to be more integrated. And if you want people from those countries to have access to people from other countries and then expand their businesses, right? So this is a key thing that I think we should always uh, thrive to develop. Um, interoperability, it's been a discussion at the WTO, it's been a discussion at UNCTAD, it's a recurrent discussion within our countries. And uh, I think it's absolutely key that we have uh, this in mind as we speak financial services in general, not only payments, but whatever transaction we need to, to do, uh, we need to have the services from one side of the border and the other side of the, of the border integrated and operational to work together. And that's absolutely key, not only domestically, but internationally as well. Great. No, definitely. I, I do definitely agree because in terms of integration, we probably have discussed in various forms other uh, areas of the digital economy, like data transfer, probably. But we haven't really talked about uh, this integ integration in terms of uh, interoperability for the financial sector, for the fintech sector, something that probably um, or we haven't discussed that much indeed across um, with other uh, the integration with other policy areas. Um, uh, uh, Rafael, what could you tell us about this for this digital integration on this financial sector point of view across the region in order to develop digital economy and SMEs? Sorry, Mike, my, my, I lost my connection. I don't know if the question was directed to me. Yeah, yeah, I just Sorry. wonder. Yeah, I was highlighting uh, the remarks from um, Mercado Libre. Um, we were talking about interoperability, something very important. But I mean, at the end of the day, we are probably closing to, uh, close to the panel. So I, I would like to identify what are some highlights, something that you would like to identify for, for the whole region, for the whole, for the government, for the private sector, uh, what is this key element or this key remark that you would like to highlight uh, that is important in order to develop uh, the digital transformation of SMEs? Uh, so since I only have a couple of minutes, basically I think we have to uh, treat different uh, people and companies in a different way, a specific way. As I said, I think we still have in our region uh, millions and millions of people uh, who aren't connected yet. We have some people who are connected but don't don't use uh, digital tools to their full, full potential. And also we have some comp people in some companies that do use digital tools and they manage to, to use them to make them more comp competitive but they aren't ready for digital transformation, for example. So I think it's a very complex problem that we have to work together, the private sector, the public sector, uh, and try to target those different challenges in, in, in specific manners. We, we can't oversimplify because uh, I think they're very uh, complex and, and each, each one of those groups have, have very specific uh, problems that we have to address. Great. Um, Anna, any final remarks? Something you would like to highlight, particularly? No, I, I will I will go back to the theme of private and public uh, working together in a collabor collaborative manner. I think this is very important to bring those um, to bring the opportunities to those micro and small merchants and to let them compete, but compete with the opportunity to compete having the opportunities and with the help to enable the skills to use all of the tools that also the private sector and the public sector I, are giving to them. I would go back to the point that I made on the collaboration and how each one of the, of the players can put their, their knowledge to support the growth of the SMEs. The SMEs in our region are almost 90% of all of the companies. The big ones are maybe less than 10%. So we need to help them to grow and to have all of those tools at Oops. 
sorry, I, I don't know if it was only me, but I, I missed your last phrase. I, I, I couldn't hear your last phrase. I don't know if it was the same for the rest of the people. Well, I said that, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I said that the SMEs are 90% of all of the companies in, the, in our countries. So it's very important to enable them uh, with the correct skills to use the tools that the public and private sector are putting in their disposal because they are the majority of the companies in our ecosystem. So we need to help them to grow and to use those tools that we are enabling for them. Uh, it, it doesn't serve if we do give the tools, but they do not know how to use. So I think the private and public sector need to collaborate to the education that we've talked before. Perfect. Yeah, completely agree. Bernardita, in that same line, what, what are the key, a key remark that you will do in order to in order to develop SMEs integration in the digital economy and the digital transformation of SMEs? Yes, uh, I would like to remark something that is related to what Anna says, uh, said, is that the um, financial system has to put in the center of their uh, occupations the, the, the clients, SMEs are, or vulnerable people. In this sense, they should uh, be transparent to explain very well the product that they are offered to those uh, to the public and not to abuse or misuse the information of those clients to put at the center of their worries and the clients uh, i think that uh, will help to to have a, a better financial system that could reach and offer a customized uh, product to all all the people of our country and your countries. Perfect, definitely. Well, I think we are at the end of the panel, and as a closing um, as a closing line, I probably would like to say that hearing from all of you, um, we do agree that we probably need to work in promotion of financial inclusion by uh, adapt advancing in the adoption of digital payments and broader digital financial systems uh, in order for us to uh, digitize payment and the, of the public sector fees and charges for greater transparency. Um, so I think this is something that we can work together in terms of uh, government and private sector. Um, so thank you very much for the great uh, conversation, for, for the great uh, components identified uh, in order for us to promote this uh, digital transformation for SMEs. I would like to pass on, um, I would like to also thank